Let's stand as we worship this morning. Great Christmas carols of our faith. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel, that mourns in only exile be, until the Son of God
You may be seated. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to come today and to worship you. That's right. Lord, we are grateful for this season, for uh, the fact that we have the opportunity uh, to just celebrate the birth of your son. Lord, and we know that that birth was part of the plan that would lead to him paying that ultimate sacrifice, that perfect sacrifice that would provide the forgiveness for our sins. And so we are grateful today. And we just give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. Wow, the 8 o'clock beat you on that one. That's a little surprise this morning, yeah. But it's good to see you anyway, and uh, glad that you are here. So hopefully uh, the energy level will increase here in just a moment uh, when I get done, right? So that'll be good. But we are glad that you are here today. I was telling the 8 o'clock crowd, uh, my boys are counting down the days. We're 10 and counting. It's hard to believe uh, till Christmas morning, and so they're excited about that. Uh, so we are all excited about Christmas, and we are grateful uh, for that opportunity. If you're a guest of ours, in the pew in front of you, you're going to find one of these connection cards. We would just be so grateful if you would take a moment and just fill that out and put that in the offering plate in a few moments when the plate passes. That would be your gift to us today. We just simply use that as a way to follow up to see if you have any questions. Uh, if there's anything you'd like for us to pray for, we would love to do that. And so if you don't mind doing that, we'd be very grateful to you for that this morning. On the back is an opportunity for prayer requests for members, for regular attenders, for guests, anyone that has a, a request or a praise, uh, if you would place that in the offering plate as well. We will pray over those on Thursday during our prayer service and would be honored to pray for that. If you would prefer that it remain confidential with the pastoral staff, there's a box on there to check and we will honor that request and will not share that with anyone else. Well, we are glad that you are all here this morning, so let's stand and greet those around you this morning.
next hymn may be a little unfamiliar to you. It tells the story of Christmas and the church. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy.
we adore you with worship. We come and adore you with carols. Now let us adore you surely with the preaching of your word. Father, your word says it will not return void unto itself. And so, Father, fill our pastor with your Holy Spirit. The text will be familiar for most. That, Father, may your spirit just do something fresh and anew during this time. Be with Mark as he preaches. Fill him with your spirit, almighty God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We had a great uh, 8 o'clock service, and I couldn't be more excited to be home. Uh, If you're not aware, I spent the last uh, 10 days or so in Israel. Uh, A group from our church, a group from a sister church, uh, was able to go and to spend 10 days there. And it was a wonderful, wonderful trip. Some folks have asked me uh, if I have um, jet lag, and I've just said, wait till you hear me preach. (laughs) And so we will see how much jet lag I have. It's about bedtime uh, in Israel, and so if we start yawning a little much, right, Vicki? If we just start laying back, falling asleep, I'll get it. So uh, we had a wonderful trip. Some folks have asked, do you feel safe there? And just to be quite frank, um, there are places in the United States of America I don't feel safe. Amen? Amen. And there was not a single place in Israel I did not feel safe. And so if if that would ever discourage you from going, I would really encourage you to consider to go. So we went. There was seven from our church. There were 16 from a sister church. This Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, Uh, In room 213, which is upstairs, the sign says Steamboat Springs. Uh, I'm going to share pictures from the trip and just a little bit of the story for, I don't you know, about 15, 20 minutes. So we would love for you to come. Some have asked if we're going back, and the answer is yes. The plan uh, is in about March of 2021. Uh, And the idea is to go to uh, the Mediterranean this time. So we go to like Athens, Cairo, Jerusalem, and we would be on a boat. So doesn't that sound nice, right? Now, we wouldn't take a boat to get there, all right? There's still planes involved, so we're not sailing across the Atlantic, but once we would get to Athens, we would uh, tour Athens and then get on a boat and spend about seven days on a cruise. So, you know, there'd be the comfort and the Christ, and so I don't know what better we could do, right? So it'll be a great trip. We'll have some information about that later. And if you might just wonder sort of why, why am I so interested in these sort of trips? Well, guess what? As we walk through Luke chapter 2 today, you're going to hear places like Bethlehem. And those who have been can picture Bethlehem. You know, we're going to see things like the stable. And those of us who have been can picture the church of the nativity. They're going to talk about the temple mount. And we can picture the temple mount. We know that for Mary and Joseph to go under the top of the Temple Mount, they had to walk on the southern steps. And guess what? I've walked on the southern steps. So it's not just a neat place to go. It's not just great sights to see, but the scripture really comes alive for you. So if you've ever thought about it, I would really encourage you to consider it. And if you want to see those pictures, please join me on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. Now, let me encourage you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. You can open your Bibles, your Bible apps, the, ba- the Bible's in the back of the pew in front of you. Just grab those and open it to Luke chapter 2. In a moment, I'm going to start reading from verse 22, and we're going to go all the way through 38. Now, some folks have said, man, Israel, that is a bucket list destination for me. Now, I'm not sure if you knew this, but, but President uh, George H.W. Bush, when he was 80, he had a bucket list. And on his bucket list was to jump out of a perfectly good airplane with a parachute, and he did it. He did it at 80, he did it at 85, and I guess he figured at age 90, might as well do it again. What do I have to lose, right? And I think maybe at that point, maybe at age 90, I might, fight, I might feel that same way. Not sure I will reach it, but gosh, I guess at 90, if you fall and it doesn't open, then you're just like, this is great. What do I care, right? right? If you're 90 here with us today, I'm sorry. I didn't, I'm not taking a shot at you, Pastor Bryce. I'm really not. So, sorry. Now, others, right, we all have 
this bucket list. If you're not familiar with what a bucket list is, it's this idea of things you want to do before you kick the bucket, right? And for those of you who don't know what that means, that simply means before you die, before you die. So things you want to do before you die. Now, some, it might be travel. Can I see some hands? Some are like, yeah, I want to travel. I want to see the world. Others, it might be parachuting. Who are the weirdos out there? Who, okay, yes, there's some wackos right here. It's no surprise who it is. So uh, it's the Owen family, right? Um, I don't know. Uh, what, what else is there on bucket list, right? List, right? Um, is there food? Yeah. Food? What is the food, Nadia? The food bucket list. Do you have, are you saying you have two? You have like, this is my bucket list and this is my food bucket list. I'd love to learn more. Maybe Elway's, right? So if anybody wants to take me, that'll just, you know, mark something off. Yeah, let's go. Chris and I will go to Elway's. So there's bucket lists, these things that people want to do right before they kick the bucket. And well, guess what? Today, we're going to see kind of a bucket list. Now, they wouldn't have used that term. They had not seen the movie. They have no idea what that's about. Maybe they didn't even have buckets in Jerusalem in the first century. I have no idea. But Simeon and Anna have a bucket list. And on their bucket list is to see the Messiah before they die. And we're going to see today that their bucket list item gets checked off. So I'm going to ask for you to follow along in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 22, and we're going to go all the way to verse 38. So just, just I don't know, strap in and let's go. It says, And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him, so the they is Mary and Joseph, and the him is Jesus. They brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the world, to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law. He, this is Simeon, took Jesus up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is open, that is, excuse me, that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband, Seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow, until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer, night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God, and to speak of Him to all who are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank You for Your Word. I thank You so much for Mary, for Jesus for Joseph, for Simeon and Anna, Lord, that we get just a picture, just in a day in their life, a day that you did extraordinary things. And so, Father, I pray that as we hear it, as we see just these, really, just a few ordinary people, and Mary and Joseph and Simeon and Anna, Lord, let's just see their faithfulness. And Lord, and crave that faithfulness for ourselves. We thank you. We ask Spirit for you to move. I need you to move. I need your help, Holy Spirit. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Now start off with me just in that verse 1 in Luke chapter 2. This is going to be very familiar to you. You see, it starts off by telling us that there was a decree that went out throughout the Roman world by the emperor Caesar Augustus. Now guess what? Caesar Augustus is a dictator. He does not share his power with anyone else. And he decides that he doesn't have enough money, and so he sends people back to their hometown so that he can tax them even more, right? That sounds wonderful. What a nice guy. So Joseph, because he's of the lineage of David, he goes back to Bethlehem. He's got to take his betrothed wife. He's not yet married. He's not yet married to Mary, but she's pregnant. 
and he takes her. She's very pregnant. And they arrive in Bethlehem. There's no rooms for them. And so they have to go into a stable. And there, Jesus is born. She wraps him in swaddling clothes. And what does she do? Lays him in a manger. But at the same time, there's just these ordinary guys. This group just out doing their job. They're shepherds, taking care of their sheep. They're doing what shepherds do. They're out in fields. And I, I don't know if you have a picture, right? So we picture fields like we picture East Aurora, right? And East Aurora is Kansas, right? Can I get an amen? And so we picture just this flat space. But I'm here to tell you that's not true. It's all just sort of um, hilly, right? Now, they call things mountains there, right? Like the mountain, uh, the Sermon on the Mountain or, you know, Mount uh, Carmel or, you know, whatever else. And those aren't mountains. Those are hills, right? Can we get a Denver amen for hills? But it's also not a field as we would picture it. It was just open space. And it was hilly. And there were valleys. And they're just watching out for their sheep. And all of a sudden, it's clearly, it must be at night, an angel appears to them. These ordinary guys. This angel appears and says these great words, right? Do not be afraid. I'm sure the shepherds are like, easier said than done, brother. And the angel says to them, for unto you is born this day in the city of David. And you can just look over there, right? Look, in the city of David, there is a Savior who is Christ the Lord. He tells them to go. You will find this baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. So they go. They obey the angel. They head out. They see it. They, they tell Mary. They tell Joseph. Mary and Joseph are amazed, right? This is consistent with them. They're just blown away every so often at what is said to them. They're amazed, and so they hear it, and then the shepherds leave. And what do the shepherds do? They tell everyone what they have seen and they have heard. We see in verse 21, Luke 2, 21, we see that Mary and Joseph are faithful people. They circumcise Jesus on the eighth day exactly according to the law of Abraham. It tells us that they give him a name. They give him the name of Jesus. And we know, we're told later, that that name is a name that is higher than any other name, right? The name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee will, every tongue will, him as Lord. But the boy had to be named. So at eight days old, He's circumcised, and he's named Jesus. Then it seems like about 33 days pass, because that was the period of purification. So Mary waits, according to the law, 33 days. She takes Jesus, she and Joseph. They head up the street to Jerusalem, and they go into the city. They head up to the temple, and we're told that they go to present him to the Lord. Every time the firstborn child is a male, he is considered holy to the Lord. You can see that in verse 23. So then they go, they offer a sacrifice. It's held a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now here's the crazy part. They're holding the Lamb of God, right? But even though they're holding the Lamb of God, they can't afford the sacrifice of the Lamb. The Levitical law, the Old Testament law, actually tells us that they are expected to offer the sacrifice of a lamb and a turtle dove. So it's not just in the song, right? They offer the sacrifice of a lamb and a turtle dove, but they can't afford it. He's a carpenter. She's a young mom. They both seem to be young. They can't even afford to purchase a lamb and a turtle dove. So the Levitical law, the Old Testament law, has grace. And it says if you can't afford a lamb and a turtle dove, you're allowed to do two turtle doves or two young pigeons. So you can picture them, maybe. Joseph is heading up with Mary into Jerusalem. He takes out his pouch, right? He opens up his pouch. He counts out his coins, and he says, Mary, we can't afford a lamb. And he hands her over the money or the two turtle doves, or the two pigeons. And I imagine they're a little bit disappointed. So they go, and they purchase them. They head up the stairs. They head up into the temple, and they're about 
to offer a sacrifice. And then all of a sudden, somebody approaches them, right? Simeon approaches them. Do you notice Simeon? How he's described? Righteous and devout. The Holy Spirit is upon him. He's awaiting the Messiah. That's what it means. That he's awaiting for the con- uh, consummation of Israel. That simply means he's waiting for the Messiah. And he's waiting for him. And he goes. The Spirit tells him. And he goes up. And again, picture a young couple. And up, up, approaches this old man. And he says, hand over your baby to me. Somebody's thinking what I was thinking. Man, that's not happening in the church today. Right? Young mom's going to be like, bro, where's your shot record? <laughs> right? You got your pertussis out of the way. You got your, I don't know, your tubercula, whatever it is, right? Let me see that shot record. And oh, by the way, you're putting on a mask and some gloves and there's Purell everywhere, right? I heard an amen. That's great. <laughs> Love it. Simeon takes Jesus in his hands. You can imagine. He's been waiting. We're not given a glimpse into his age. Anna, it seems like she's 84. We don't have any idea how old Simeon is. Takes Jesus into his hands and looks at him. He's looking at a baby. And he says these words to the baby. Lord, he says, he blesses God and says, Lord, you are now, you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your, for my eyes have seen your salvation. He's looking at a baby. Salvation is in a baby that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. A light for revelation to the Gentiles. Man, if he says this too loud, he's going to get in trouble. Right? If he says way too loud in the midst of those people in the temple, those Israelites who think salvation is reserved for them, he says this is here, the Messiah is here, a light of revelation to the Gentiles. And a Gentile, if you don't know, is anybody in this case who is not Jewish. So he looks at the baby and he says, this is a light to the Gentiles. Salvation will come to them. And he finishes by saying, and a glory to your people Israel and his father and his mother, right, again are blown away. As you can again picture Simeon, right, handing him back over. I don't know about you, I got this picture of Santa, right, just this old, jolly old man handing him back to mom and dad. And mom and dad are just looking at Jesus, looking at Simeon, looking at Jesus. Forty days old blown away then Simeon turns to the mom and he offers up a second prophecy do you see it it's in verse 34 and he says to his mom behold Mary this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that thoughts So that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. He knows. He knows that Jesus is not going to fulfill that prophecy. Fulfill being the Messiah in a way that people expect. You see, Israel is waiting for a king. They're waiting for a Messiah to come in and wipe out the Romans. But he knows. This baby will see the goats separated from the sheep. We'll see the chaff separated from the wheat. We'll see some taken out of God's people and a whole new group added in. And it's going to pierce your soul, Mary. You see, in the church that is built, and for whatever reason, any time you want to go to to a a site uh, in Jerusalem and in Bethlehem and in that area, there's a church there. A very, typically, a very, very old church. One that's 1,600, 1,700 years old. For whatever reason, they said, okay, there's Golgotha. We're going to build a church on Golgotha. So you can't even tell that Golgotha is there anymore. You feeling me? And we're going to put over the, uh, over the stable, we're going to put a church. You can't even tell that there was a stable there. We're going to put uh, a church over an a empty tomb. And so you can't even tell that there's a tomb there. But in this church called the Holy Sepulcher, there is an altar. And the altar is built over just the top, the precipice of the hill of Golgotha. And just up and to the right, if you've been there, maybe you can picture it. There's a painting of Mary. And there's a sword in her chest. She was there, right? If you fast forward 33 years or so, 
There's Mary. She had brought in her baby up to the temple. She had gone to find her baby when he was 10, and she couldn't find him. And there she was when he's on the cross. She's at the foot of the cross. She's standing next to John. She's seeing him die. Innocent. But condemned to death. And you can imagine that sword piercing her heart. So Simeon understands that the road that Christ is about to follow The path of the Messiah is a difficult one. He will separate Israel. He's going to separate the sheep from the goats, the wheat from the chaff. He's going to divide a country. And in doing so, it's going to be like a sword pierces mom. Now, it just so happens, and we know that in Scripture there's no such thing as just so happens. There was a prophetess, Anna, She is headed up to the temple. She's worshiping, she's fasting, she's praying night and day. And at that very hour, do you see it in verse 38? You can imagine Simeon saying these things, holding this baby, handing him back to Mary and to Joseph, saying these things to Mary. And then there's Anna, standing there, 84 years old, a widow for decades. And she gets to see it, and then she too turns, and she says to all who are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem, that's got to be a lot of people, y'all. Right? That's like saying we're all waiting for the Broncos to be good, right? There's a lot of people, y'all, who are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. They're desperate. It's been centuries since they've been allowed to lead and rule over themselves. And they're just ready for God to redeem Jerusalem. And so she goes, and she speaks of Jesus to all who are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. She talks and says, the Messiah is here. As we see these things, we see Mary, we see Joseph, we see Simeon, we see Anna. What I want us to do, the very first thing I want us to do, having walked through this passage already, is simply see ordinary faithfulness. Okay? That's the first thing we're going to do today is simply see some ordinary faithfulness. Now, when I speak of ordinary, understand this. Like I said, this is the poor offering, right? This is Mary and Joseph cannot afford the lamb. They are ordinary folks. You feel me? They are normal, everyday people who are going up to the temple. And I guarantee you on that day, Right? Nobody is expecting the Messiah to show up. I don't know what day of the week it is, right? What is the most mundane, ordinary day? Like Tuesday? I don't know. Right? So it's a Tuesday. Right? Things are just happening. The priests are there doing sacrifices. The scribes are there teaching. The Pharisees are there judging, right? Other people are selling animals. And we have an ordinary day. An ordinary couple. And then a man who's given no titles, right? We don't have any idea who Simeon is. Now, his character is described, but it's not like that he's a member of the Pharisees. It's not like he's a scribe. It's not that he's a priest. It's not he's a member of the aristocracy. It's not like he's an important person, right? The only thing we know about him is his character. Everything else about him, as far as we know, is that he's just an ordinary guy, The same thing with Anna. Yes, she's a prophetess, but she's just of the the house and the tribe of Asher, an ordinary, everyday Jewish woman. Nothing special about her. She's just there. But we also see a picture of faithfulness, do we not? We see a young couple that three times in this passage it speaks to their faithfulness. You see, in verse... uh, Excuse me, in verse 39, which we haven't gotten to yet, it says that they performed everything according to the law. They were just ordinary, faithful people. In verse 24, they offered a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. In verse 27, the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law. All we know about Mary and Joseph right now is that they are ordinary and faithful. 
faithful people. We see also that in the description of Simeon, we see a description of faithfulness, right? If we see here in verse 25 that he's righteous, he's devout, he's waiting for the Messiah, and the Holy Spirit is upon him. He's faithful. We see that the Holy Spirit tells him, and he believes it, that he will not die until he sees the Christ. And we know that on that very day, the Spirit tells him to go up to the temple. And he obeys. He's faithful and goes. And we see with Anna, she's a prophetess. And we see her faithfulness in verse 37, that she worships with fasting and prayer night and day. They're faithful. Ordinary, faithful people. But here's the catch. You may be sitting there saying, Pastor Mark, I just don't agree that they're ordinary people. After all, we're talking about Mary, Joseph, Simeon, and Anna. These people are pretty extraordinary, right? They're extraordinary people. And I would actually agree with you. I would say what's extraordinary is that ordinary faithfulness is so unheard of, it's so unseen, it's so unfamiliar that it's extraordinary. Just simple, simple everyday, ordinary faithfulness is extraordinary. People who live according to the word, people who are devoted to the Lord, people who are faithful in what they do are extraordinary. Now, here's the beautiful thing. God works through ordinary faithfulness. So this next thing that we're going to see is we need to recognize God's work. Okay? If you look again at the passage, recognize God's work. The Holy Spirit is speaking. He's speaking to Simeon. In verse 27, he came in the Spirit. So there's some idea that the Spirit has talked to him. And so he goes. So he hears the Spirit. God is at work and it sends Simeon to the temple. We also see with Anna... Right? In verse 38, it says, And coming up at that very hour, we see that the God is at work. There is no coincidence in the Bible. God is at work. She goes, and she gets to see the Messiah. God is at work. God works through ordinary faithfulness. Now, if you were to turn in your Bibles to Daniel, don't. To Daniel chapter 6. We'll encounter... To those who've been in church for any amount of time, it would be just a real familiar story. You see, Daniel is in, under, excuse me, the leadership of King Darius. By this time, Persia's in charge. No longer uh, is it um, Babylon, but now Persia is in charge. And Daniel has been put up. He's one of 120 governors over the land of Persia. And Daniel is pretty good at his job. And what happens is that Daniel is so good at his job that three co-workers get jealous. Right? Have you ever had that experience? Not here at MABC. I don't have that experience. Thank you. I appreciate it, Andy. Three of his co-workers get jealous. Three of his co-workers devise a plan. They go to the king and they say, hey, King Darius, you're a humble guy. So let's say over about, I don't know, about the next month, nobody can worship any God except for you. And Darius, humble guy, says, sounds good. So he signs it into law. That if anybody worships somebody other than Darius, they're going to get thrown into the lion's den. Right? We think our politicians are a little narcissistic, right? Right? doesn't matter your, your, your creed or your color or whatever. Right? So King Darius signs it. Do you know what Daniel does? He goes home, opens his window facing Jerusalem, and he prays three times that day. You can picture again in your head those three uh, enemies of his just rubbing their hands together, right? They're waiting. Do they have binoculars in? I have no idea. So you just can imagine they're watching, and they're like, we got him. They go to the king. They say, King Darius, do you remember your law? And King Darius is like, I just wrote it yesterday. They say, well, you said that if anybody worships anyone other than you or prays anybody other than you over the next 
month or so are going to get thrown in the lion's den. And Darius is like, I totally remember that. And they say, well, guess what? Daniel has been praying still. And so in grief, the king goes, I'm sure not personally, gets Daniel and throws him in the lion's den. You might remember the story. Darius fasts and prays that night. He's nervous for his friend. Very first thing the next day, he goes, he says, uncover the stone. He sees Daniel, are you in there? And Daniel's like, I'm good. So they raise Daniel out of that pit, and he throws in those three buddies. And here's the incredible thing. Do you remember? The very end of that passage, you know what happens next? King Darius gets out his pen and his paper. He fires up Microsoft Word. He writes this email and he says, to everyone in his kingdom, Daniel's God is a living and true God. King Darius goes from wanting worship for himself to just at least, at least recognizing that the one true God is the one true God. So he goes and he turns from king into evangelist. This is Darius. Now, I'm not saying Darius was saved. I'm not saying Darius is going to be in heaven. I'm not saying Darius' life was changed. But guess what? God worked through Daniel. And the whole kingdom heard that Yahweh is the Lord. And what did Daniel do? What's the, Daniel opens up his window, and what does he do? He prays. Man, it's not like he does some huge act of faithfulness, right? Right? Think about it. All Daniel does is pray, just like he had done the day before, and the day before, and the day before. All Daniel does is pray. Is prayer extraordinary? No. Prayer's ordinary. Was Daniel faithful in what he did? Well, let me hear you, folks. Yes! Daniel opens the window and practices ordinary faithfulness. And a whole country hears about who God is. That's incredible. All he does is pray, and at the end of it, an entire nation, a pagan nation, nation hears there is a God in Israel and he is real. Ordinary faithfulness. God works through ordinary faithfulness. Now you might ask, okay, pastor, what does ordinary faithfulness look like? If you weren't bored, I'm going to already bore you now. Ordinary faithfulness is simply opening up God's word every day reading God's Word, praying, and then obeying, okay? Faithfulness, ordinary faithfulness is what we're called to do. We're called to, and I don't know what this looks like in your morning, right? Maybe you wake up, you grab that cup of coffee, you grab that hot chocolate, you roll with that cider or that can of Diet Coke. I don't know what your morning looks like. But ordinary faithfulness for you would be just grabbing your coffee, Grabbing your Bible, even grabbing a prayer list, sitting at your coffee table, sitting at your kitchen table, sitting in your closet, headed out to the garage, sitting on your back porch. I don't know what it is, right? But it doesn't matter. It's just grabbing your Bible and reading it, grabbing your prayer list and praying it, and then obeying. That's ordinary faithfulness. It's as simple as this. Read, pray, obey. You got me? So what do we need to do every single day? Read, pray, and obey. Now, obey is the hardest part, right? Now, there is some hardship, right, in every single day, getting up and reading the Word, praying, 
But the hardest part is obedience, right? It's really taking what you're reading and applying it to your life, right? That tends to be the hardest part. So what does ordinary, everyday obedience look like? Jesus gave us two commands. Do you remember them? Matthew 22, about 37, what does he say? Love God. That's right. And what else? Love others. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, here's the problem in our society. We hear, love your neighbor as yourself. And we hear the golden rule, right? Jesus wrote the golden rule. And we hear, treat others as they treat you. That's the American golden rule. Treat others exactly as they would treat you. I promise you, go to your friends who don't really go to church. And ask them, what's the golden rule? And that's what they're going to say. Treat others as they treat you. I promise. I've asked this question a lot. Right? Poor Starbucks baristas. Right? Hey, what's the golden rule? Treat others like they treat you. Awesome. My name is Bryce. Can you put that on my coffee cup? (laughs) I don't know how to spell it. I'm sorry. B with rice. I I don't even know. The golden rule is treat others, help me out, as you would want them to treat you. Love others in the same way that you would have them love you. Is there, though, this opportunity to say, well, they're not loving to me, so I'm not loving to them? Right? Is that obey? It's not. Right? Obeying says, doesn't matter how kind you are to me. It doesn't matter how friendly you are to me. It doesn't matter if you do right by me. I'm going to love you. I'm going to treat you like I would want to be treated. And so when I, every day, I open up God's word and I read it. Every day I sit down with my coffee and I pray. Sometimes with my eyes open, depending on how much coffee, right? And then I have to just go out in my life, in my home, in my workplace, in my community, and somehow even I-25, and I have to love others just as Jesus commanded me to do. That is boring, ordinary, everyday faithfulness. But guess what? You do that, and guess what kind of person you are? Extraordinary. God uses ordinary faithfulness and he does it in an extraordinary way do you hear me church so you're going to walk out and you'll be like man all pastor mark told me to do today was like wake up tomorrow read my bible he didn't even tell me where well i'm just going to tell you read luke 16 all right between now and the 24th christmas eve you'll finish the book of luke if you start tomorrow in luke 16 Read Luke 16, and then Luke 17, and then Luke 18, and then pray. Pastor, I don't have a prayer list. Cool. Don't worry about it. Just start praying. And then obey. What does it look like to love others? You love them, even when they don't love you. You show kindness to them, when they don't show kindness to you. You show peacefulness, patience. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's obedience. Right? The fruit of the Spirit is the obedient Christian life. Right? We show to others love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Right? We do those things, and we are extraordinary. And guess what? If you do the ordinary, faithful things, guess what kind of home you're going to have? A lot better than it is right now. Guess what kind of workplace you're going to have? A whole lot better one than you've got right now. Guess what kind of church we'll have? An even better one than we have now. God will anoint a person who is ordinary in their faithfulness. God will anoint a family that shows ordinary faithfulness. God will anoint a church that shows ordinary faithfulness. And God will change a city when His people show ordinary faithfulness. So that's all I'm calling us to do this week. That's not much, right? 
Read, pray, obey. Just like Mary, Joseph, Simeon, and Anna. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just honestly need your help. We can't do that on our own. We've shown it. We need your help, Spirit, that when we wake up tomorrow, that we open up your word and we read it. We spend time in prayer and then we obey what Jesus has commanded us to do. We need your help. Lord Jesus, we need your help to love others in the same way that we would want to be loved. To treat others in the same way we would want to be treated. We need your help to show the fruit of the Spirit. We need your help to obey. We need your help to tell people about Jesus. We need your help to live a faithful life. We need your help to be obedient. We need your help to be faithful. And so, Lord, help us in our weakness. Because we know that where we are weak, you are strong. And Father, if there's anyone in this room who does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, we pray that they will today. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. As we close, I just want to take a moment and share the story of a friend of mine. He's a new friend. Uh, I met him in Israel. His name is V. I believe it's spelled Z-V-I. I didn't name him. Don't get mad at me. Right? His name is V. I would love for you to pray for my friend Z. You see, on the first night, we're sitting in the hotel, and Zvi is our guide. And I said to Zvi, Zvi, I know that you know a lot about Jesus. I know that you could walk me to where it said that he was born, where he bled, where he died, and where he rose again. But you don't believe in Jesus. Is that correct? He said, right. He was a non-practicing Jew, not a Christian. And I said, well, Zvi, how do you not believe? And he really had a problem with this idea that God expects things of us. So he had a hard time with all the rules and the laws. You can imagine being Jewish, right? All the rules and the laws of Judaism. And he said, you know, I just know that I'm a good person. And I said, buddy, how can you be sure? How can you be sure that you're good enough? And we talked about a whole lot of things, right? I mean, he knew his Bible really well. He knew his theology pretty good. He just didn't place his faith and his trust in Jesus Christ. We had to talk through the fact that God did not institute these laws to oppress us, but instead to give us a beautiful life. He still hasn't accepted Jesus, right? All I did was make sure that if you're going to meet me, you're going to hear about Jesus. That's all I did, right? And then I'm praying that he will respond one day with whomever. But I want to ask you, Everyone gathered here, you like to be. Do you know things about Christmas, right? I mean, you know Bethlehem. You're like, yeah, Jesus, Bethlehem, stable, shepherds, wise men, angels, drummer boy. Right? I know the story in the Bible. Right? Gold, frankincense, and some other thing that I've never heard of before. Right? Myrrh, don't even know what it is. But I know the Christmas story. Therefore, I have to be good with God because I'm a good person. I'm here to tell you, friends, it's not enough to be good. There's not enough good things that you could do in this world to be saved. It's only, only in what you do about Jesus. You have to believe in him. You have to believe that he died and he rose again. But not only do you have to believe in that, you have to say, yes, I understand that Jesus was the Lamb of God. I understand that He died for me. Right? I understand that Jesus died and rose again. You 
also have to say, you know, but now, not only is he the Lamb of God, he's also the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd know his sheep. That's what Jesus said about himself. He said, he is the Good Shepherd. He knows his sheep. His sheep know his voice. He knows them by name. He calls them and they come to him. So here's the deal. You can believe that Jesus died. You can believe that Jesus rose again. But until you say, I'm giving my life over to him, I not only believe it, but I'm going to apply it. I'm not only going to say he's my, he's my lamb that died for me, but now he's also my good shepherd. So I'm committing to follow him. You ask God to forgive your sins. You believe that he died and rose again, and then you surrender your life to follow him. And if you can know every single detail there is about Jesus, just like Zvi, that boy was asking us obscure scriptural points. He was like, what is the third word in Luke chapter 4? And I'm like, bro, I have no idea, but he knew it. What is that good for him? You could gain the whole world of knowledge, and you can forfeit your soul. So if you're here today and you have not yet said, yes, I admit I'm a sinner. Yes, I believe that Jesus died for my sins and rose again. But today, for the very first time, I'm committing my life to follow him. If that's you, the pastors will be down front as Chris leads in song. We would love to share more with that. Share more about that with you. If you're in need of prayer, and I get it, this is a hard time of year for some. You might feel lonely. You might feel broken. You might feel heart broken. You might feel shame. You might feel lonely. We would love to pray with you. We love you. The pastors, your pastors love you. And we don't want you to carry any burden alone. We want to share it with you. We want to pray with you. If there's any other need that you might have, if you'd like to know how to join the church, if you'd like to know more about the church, if you're in any other type of just prayer need or whatever is going on in your life, we would love to visit with you. So as Chris leads in song, let me ask for everyone to stay and respond as God wants you to respond. Oh, come let us adore Him. Oh, come let us adore Him.
just the voices sing. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. God's Word tells us more of who Jesus is. And His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Amen. Mighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. Mm. Jesus is all of these. Who is he to you? Thank you, Father. Mm. Thank you for this day. Thank you that one day you looked at your son and you said, it's time. We rejoice. We rejoice that it is the time when we especially let the world know that you came. And we are thankful. Lord, let us not forget. Let us not forget. For it is in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. You don't know what you're being spared from. Uh, we don't have video announcements, but man, you're going to thank me if you ever watch those uh, from the 8 o'clock service. Praise the Lord for that. Who does God love throughout Scripture? Throughout Scripture, he, he says he loves, there's three categories of people. Who are they? Widows, orphans. And aliens, right? He, he loves those people. Uh, and it's clear throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, you have an opportunity today to love those who God specifically loves. We're going to have a business meeting at 4 o'clock. Okay, it's going to be awesome. Yeah, business meeting. Woo! Love business meeting. But can I just tell you this? After the business meeting, we're going to have hot chocolate and cider in here during the business meeting. It's going to be crazy, yes. But after that, we're going to have the opportunity to go to Juvenile Village, uh, to Springbrook, where we have a Bible study each and every week, and then to Dayton Place, where many of our folks uh, are there. And we're going to get to sing Christmas carols. With those who God loves specifically throughout Scripture, okay? And he really commands us to go and take care of them. So it's really, if you want to put into practice what our pastor preached, we can obey this afternoon. Love to see you here. We're going to do some great Christmas caroling uh, to those folks. So see you at 4. We'll go Christmas caroling about 5.30. Uh, we love families here at Mississippi Avenue Baptist Church, all shapes, all sizes. Uh, if you have fifth graders and below, and you would like three hours of free child care, I'll pay for it this week. This, this week, if you're a guest and this is your first time here, and you need three, three hours of child care, see the Connect desk out there, go sign up. Kathy Peters and her team do a great job. Again, if you're a guest uh, here, you get three free hours, I'll take care of it, okay? So again, make sure you take advantage of that. Then, next week, uh, we have a chance to uh, repeat what you guys did as a church uh, back in September. We absorbed the Lord's Supper, uh, which is a very special time. We're going to do that next Sunday, instead of the fifth Sunday on the 29th, when we have lots of folks traveling, uh, we thought it would be better for us as church to gather and have the Lord's Supper uh, on uh, that uh, Sunday when we'll have more folks here. But then, as part of our tradition, you guys blew it away last week. Pastor Mark's going to talk to you in a little bit what you all did back in December, the amount you give. But we're going to take a benevolence offering then, and you're going to get to see here in just a second when Pastor Mark announces some of the cool things that we are doing as a church. So again, look forward to that next Sunday, December 22nd. Then on December 29th, uh, there are no small groups. Uh, we realize uh, that's sort of a in-between Sunday, between Christmas and the New Year's, and it's sort of, so we're going to give our small groups a down day. So no small groups, but you're going to have a great time of worship at 1045. 
And again, if you still want to come and meet here, uh, that's fine. Just talk to Bryce because I won't be here. Mark won't be here. Uh, yeah, Bryce will come and unlock the doors like at 530 for you or something like that, okay? <laughs> so if you want to meet small groups, it'd be great. Then finally, what are these things I'm holding in my hand? Simple invitations. That's what we view them as, right? And that's really what their the function is. But what if this was a soul? Somebody in chains for all eternity. There's a table full of these back there. Do you have neighbors? Yes. Do you have workers, co-workers? Yes. Do you have family members? Yes. This is not just a simple invitation. It could be the very keys to the kingdom of heaven. And they're going to get to hear the gospel presented on Christmas Eve. This time of year is one of the most times that many lost people are saying, hmm, should I go to a Christmas service somewhere? Why wouldn't it be here at Mississippi Avenue Baptist Church? The choir is going to have some great music. Mark's going to have a powerful message. It's going to be a very special time. Please don't leave those out on that table. You know where they go once it's passed? It's in the trash. Is that what you think of your neighbors, your co-workers, your friends, your family? I know you don't. So again, respond and go get those today. Pastor Mark, I know you got a couple of cool announcements. We're just going to keep doing stuff until the business meeting. Hope you all are okay with that. <laughs> <clears throat> Making up for lost time. <laughs> So thank you uh, for being here today. God is good, is he not? Thank you for sticking around. There's always a blessing in the benediction, so those folks who left are missing out on the blessing. First, I'm going to invite uh, Jafet and Cynthia, if you all will come up here for me, please. Uh, back in uh, early part of, sem of September, uh, these dear uh, friends and church members uh, sent me a note and said, well, pastor, uh, you know, we're from Nigeria and uh, the roof of our, uh, of, of the church building in our village collapsed uh, and uh, we're raising money to build it. And I, I was a little broken hearted uh, because at the time the churches, uh, yes, you can see it, you can see it there. Uh, the church's benevolence offering at the time was in the negative, and so was was really you know concerned if we would be able to help them at all, uh, and so we then had, as Chris referenced, uh, on the fifth Sunday in September, we had Lord's Supper, and as our habit, we had a benevolence offering, uh, and you guys raised five thousand dollars. Now, uh, that we obviously that's to care for people in our community. That's to care for people in our church family, and then it's to care for people around the world. Now, we don't believe uh, that a church building is the church, amen? amen? But the church building is a tool that the church uses for worship, for discipleship, and for reaching others, right? And so we have $1,000 uh, to give to Jafet and Cynthia as they uh, head back to Nigeria this week. And so God is good, is he not? We love you guys. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And they were kind enough to be willing to come on stage. And I know that that's, that's not an easy thing to do. So thank you so much. We'll be praying for your travels, praying for the church. The, the, you know, the faith is under attack uh, in Nigeria. And so anything that we can do to really bless and help our friends is just a wonderful opportunity to do. So thank you guys. Okay, I'll yeah. use this opportunity to thank everyone. Yes, please do. And, um, Step up. Um, I need your prayers. We need your prayers because um, next Sunday, by this time, we're already in the flight. Going to Nigeria, you're not going to be able to see us for about one month, at least four weeks. So we'll be back again. Through your prayer, our travel, our trip will be safe. And then we will be bring you some pictures. And there have been a lot of improvement, a lot of work going on in the church. I, we, me and my wife have rallied some of my communities in the United States. They have sent some money over there. 
and this will go a long way to helping them. Praise Thank Lord. you very much. Praise the Lord. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then I'm going to invite uh, the remainder of the Ulrich family onto stage, please. There's a blessing in the benediction today, y'all. Stick with us. This is Pastor Bryce's last Sunday. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We want to offer congratulations to Dr. Bryce Ulrich. So Bryce just graduated from Mid Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary with his doctor in ministry. We'll pass out the trustees' phone numbers if you're concerned about that. Uh, but we have a gift for the Ulrich family. Our church has given you $500, and we're so grateful for everything you did. God bless you guys. Now, if you guys need anything, if you're in need of prayer, if you're in need of a word, if you're in need of learning more about the church, the pastors will be outside uh, of the prayer room here in a moment. And Chris, what song are we singing to lead out? Go tell it on the mountain. Let's stand and let's sing. Let's hear you. Amen.